<laughs> Anybody else out there alive? Yes. Wasn't that a wonderful service this morning that we shared together? And I told Pastor Wendell that that was so great. I hope, Pastor, that you're still alive when I pass, because I want to hear you pray over me. <laughs> uh, that's just an anointed prayer. Tonight we'll continue what we've been doing, which is looking at this concept of holiness from the book of Ephesians. So whether you've been with us or not, tonight we'll have all of it rounded up in such a way that you'll know what's going on and what God is calling us to. If you're joining us by live stream, I have all kinds of handouts that the people here have, and I'm willing to send those to you ahead of time. Um, so if you're continuing to come back next week or whenever, and this goes for you all too, if you happen to need to stay home and watch us, uh, I can easily send this to you and you can see it. Just contact me at tcross, all lowercase, tcross at leeuniversity.edu. tcross at leeuniversity.edu. That's probably not the right one, Philip. <laughs> uh, 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 all right, well, uh, we've been having a time of prayer, and I'm ready to jump into the Word of God because here it comes again. This has got to stop. I don't know how it is that I just begin to speak something, and the Spirit of God strikes my heart. <laughs> so I'm not going to apologize for that. I just can't help it. Let's just, let's just pray again that the Holy Spirit will get through what I'm trying to say. Lord, I'm your servant tonight. I pray that you will make my mind clear and that you will clarify things and the questions and people asking and contributing tonight, that we might hear your voice in this difficult world. Amen. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1, because we'll start there, but we won't end there. We've been in Ephesians all along, and I was struck this summer by the concept of holiness in Ephesians. And I think it's a concept that doesn't get a lot of discussion anymore. So I think it's one we need to hear in today's world. Ephesians chapter 1, I'd like us to begin with verse 17. So Paul is in the middle of a thanksgiving prayer. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? Well, the NIV has this next phrase, so that you may know him better. I pray that God gives you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. This power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all other authority, all authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. Look at verse 17 one more time. I pray that I keep on asking that God the Father gives you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. That's going to be the beginning focus of our night. So that you may know him better. Okay, the last few weeks we've looked at how God's people are chosen in Christ in chapter 1. And then we looked at the way we were, dead in our trespasses and sin in chapter 2. 
Then we push that further in chapter 4, verse 17. This is how people were motivated, you and I, when we walked in darkness and didn't know any better. Tonight, we get to the point that Paul is making here, especially in the fourth chapter, verse 20 and 21. So the reason I started in Ephesians 1 is because I'm going to go back there. I want you to see that Paul, through the Holy Spirit, has a way of weaving these things and coming back and stating them again in a slightly different way. Watch what he says here in verse 20 of chapter 4. <clears throat> that, however, and the that is having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Verse 8 and 19 there, right above it. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Okay, go to the, the chart that I've given you or that you will receive in the future. Uh, the very first page. I gave you this kind of sketch last time. The whole Christian life can be summed up in this. The grace of God coming to us and the gratitude that we show for that grace by walking it out. Grace and gratitude. Why do we live the Christian life? That answer has got to be settled in our mind. Why do we choose to be holy when the rest of the world isn't? The only way you can do that is through these steps that Paul has written here. These are some of the most powerful words Paul ever writes. And I have a little note right underneath of the first step, learn Christ on the left-hand column. Ignore the right-hand column with Colossians for a moment because that says almost the exact same thing and we'll get to that in a, near the end. But look at the column on the left. I have in italics the phrase, so what does this look like? What does he mean to learn Christ? And that is literally what it is. It doesn't say to learn about Christ. Unfortunately, the NIV put the word about in there. It wasn't, it's not there. How do you learn Christ? Well, I think that's where the first verse, in, back in chapter 1, verse 17, no, notes for us what that means. But before we go back there, I want to suggest that in the church for a long time, we have preached that people should be holy, or that people should be good, or that people should behave in a certain way. But we've been totally deficient on how to help people get there. I want to say that again. We have been very good about proclaiming the gospel and the that's. That we should be good, that we should be holy, that we should love God, that we... But we have been deficient on helping people do that in the practice of their everyday lives. How do you get there? This came to me most clearly when I was pastoring. <laughs> An individual had been offended by another individual in her family or his family, I can't remember which it was. And that person says, <laughs> tell me, I know that I'm supposed to forgive this person. Tell me, how do I do it? So it's a whole different thing when you're staring a reality in, your, in the face, you know that you are supposed to love your enemy, but what do you do to get to a point in life to do that? I want to tell you tonight that the reason why this has affected me so much is because this is really a powerful step forward in the Christian life that can resolve a whole lot of things. This is the how through every other aspect of our lives, it also gives us the why. So the first thing in the first step, and then we're gonna look at, well, what does this look like? This is how I talk to my students constantly. You want to tell me about a principle you see in scripture or an idea that you think ought to be done in the church? Tell me what it looks like. 
it's become so prominent that they usually turn back on me and says, okay, we just heard you lecture on justification. What does that mean? Tell me what it looks like. So if it's unclear still at the end of tonight, I expect you to tell me that. But I think it will ring true to you. First, one of the things that you do, must do is to know Christ fully and experientially. So now I take us back to chapter 1, verse 17, where we started tonight. I keep on asking God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom so that you may know him better. That phrase, know him better, is a particular Greek word, which means to know fully and experientially. So I put that there in writing, and I rarely will throw a Greek word at you, but this one is a really good one to know. There are many places in the New Testament where Paul and other writers use this word when they're talking about knowing Jesus Christ. It isn't just knowing about him. It's knowing him through experience. Okay, so the first how-to, get to know Jesus Christ by experience. You feel that? That should be about as Pentecostal as it gets, right? I mean, we believe the Holy Spirit is in our experience, and we should be able to know the risen Christ in some way that will help us for the rest of the things that are listed here. So know Christ fully. Learn of him by being with him. One of the foremost things that we can do in, in learning Christ, I think, is prayer. Not prayer that is all petition. There's a place for petition. But prayer that is sitting in the presence of God, understanding more and more and meditating, soaking yourself up in the word of God. Who is this Jesus? The Jesus I know is the one I learned in prayer and in scripture. If you take out prayer, you take out the experience of knowing who this God is. You can't know Jesus from a distance and truly know Jesus. So Paul starts the how-to with learn Christ. And I think that's going back to the first passage that I mentioned, first, uh, Ephesians 1.17, to know him fully and experientially. So that, and here comes this, the second part, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So if Ephesians 1.17 was the first scripture peg for tonight, look at Ephesians 3.17. It'll be easy to remember this, chapter 3 and chapter 1, the same verse. One of the greatest prayers in all of the New Testament literature that we have, Paul says, I bow on my knee before the Father. I pray that his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being, so that you may, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, long, high, and deep is the love of Christ. I just pray that I can clarify what is in my heart and my head well enough right now. so that Christ may make his home in you. That's what it literally means. What an image that the Lord of glory, who created all the worlds, is the one who also wants to make his home with me. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and established in love, there's the grounding so your roots sink deeply into the soil of God's love. So that when the winds come, you're like the oak tree, hanging in there. The wet can sway all it wants to up here. But there's strength in the soil of love. 
that your roots are st- sunk into. We had a, a, a Welch preacher that came my last year at Lee to do convocation, so 1977, 78. <laughs> Just a wonderful move of the spirit when he was there. And he had this great Welch accent. He actually was a philosophy professor who was incredible. Uh, I think his last name was Price. You may remember him, Dr. Lee. It was a... Evans. Well, it could have been Evans, too. Yeah, that's... Well, this was the first time he had come and his first sermon on a Monday morning. We had convocation morning and evening at those times. By the way, convocation is tonight at Lee. And on that Monday morning, he preached a sermon about being rooted in the soil. And he gave an, a description of how a British broadcaster on the BBC would give answers to everyone that called in. Why is my favorite zinnia not producing and why are my vegetables looking like this and he said he always began every answer that he gave with the answer my friend lies in the soil (laughs) I still remember that to this day I can hear the Welsh accent and everything you know he went on to preach and before he finished preaching I've never seen this before or since people ran to the front to pray It was a Monday morning, folks. If you can get the spirit to move at Lee on a Monday morning, God is in that place. (laughs) Okay, maybe I shouldn't have said it quite that way, but okay. That's true. The answer to a lot of our problems lies in the soil. Where are you sticking your roots? Are you rooted and established in the latest social media fad? Are you rooted and established in the conflict of the cultural political climate? Are you rooted and established in things that have nothing to do with God? If so, don't be surprised when the winds come if you're going to lose a few branches and maybe topple over and have to start all over again. How do you become a holy person? You learn Christ, and part of that is you learn him by experience in your life, but you also allow him to dwell in your heart by faith, to make his house there, and you are rooted to the depths in the soil of God's being. You get enough God in you, God is going to come out. Even in points of persecution, even in points of disruption, which we'll get to tonight. But what is it that Paul is praying in chapter 3, verse 18, that you may have power together with all the holy people of God, the saints, to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, and that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. These frequently sound just like a bunch of holy words that we've heard before. I pray that they not end up that way tonight. Look at what Paul is praying, that you may have power to understand. Okay, most of us would say that you may have an intellect to understand, or you may have some intelligent quotient to have an ability to grasp what I'm saying or that you have to have a certain IQ level or a certain way of understanding the world Paul isn't doing you just got to have the Holy Spirit's power to even begin to grasp the dimensions of God's love in Jesus Christ okay that's quite frankly that's the part that I've been crying about all night (laughs) because I was reminded of sermons I used to preach when I was pastoring and how I I just think it's still true. Why is this crucial? I wrote down in my notes. Because without a grasp of God's love in Jesus Christ, we cannot even begin to be holy or know why. 
Now that may not make sense, but I hope I can tease that out. Here's what I think. Why do people struggle with doing what God wants? Okay, I'm not suggesting that it's you. It is me sometimes. There are sometimes somebody slaps me in the face, I want to get right back. There's just something about the old nature that wants to live again. <laughs> and it does so with a lot of strength. Why is it that I struggle with that? Why do you, perhaps, struggle with doing what you know is right? Why did Paul, the good that I would do, I do not do? <laughs> and the very thing I don't want to do, I end up doing. Romans 7. That's where a lot of us are. I have counseled and worked with people one-on-one -on -one in my ministry so many times and I try to get them to see this, it's just a hard thing to grasp. And it shouldn't be hard. I think the enemy tricks us, or the flesh makes us dull of learning. Because of the immensity of God's love for us, we respond with gratitude. That's what the grace gratitude means. If we don't understand the grace, we ain't getting any gratitude. We're getting selfish motivation for why we want to do what we want to do and why we want God to do what we want to do. That was a brilliant part of Terry Hart's sermon this morning. God isn't about coming here to make you happy. He didn't enter flesh just to make you happy. Whoa, I, I don't think that speaks to those of us in this generation as much as it does to the 20-year-old that I see every day because that is not what they have learned in many places they have been. I didn't say churches, but it could have, you fill in that blank, wherever it is. In many places that they have been, they have not learned that. That was a word this morning. And you know what? I, I kind of think we all need to hear that again, even us older fogies, yes? yes? We all need to hear every now and then, it ain't about me. But, but, but wait a second, <laughs> I want it to be about me. I want God to do something that I want God to do. And if he doesn't do it now, you see what I'm just doing there? I'm mimicking my seven-year-old grandson. <laughs> yeah? And that's a sad thing for a 65-year-old person to be doing. What makes it so hard for us to get to that point? Why do we struggle doing what God wants us to do as Christians. I'm not even speaking about the world. I don't, have a, I don't expect light out of darkness. It just ain't going to come. But I do expect some light out of people of the light. Yeah? But, but I'm speaking now to myself. Why is it when I need to have that critical moment of answering, yes, Lord, I will do, that I, I can easily flip and fall? My feeling is that we all do not grasp the love of God in Jesus Christ. The answer to every struggle that a Christian might have is Jesus Christ. Learn who Christ is. Experientially know the dimensions of God's love in Jesus Christ. Understand the burning power that is there in the cross. His love for us caused, it cost him the Son of God, and it cost the Son his own life. There was a wound in God's very being created by the death of the Son. That's a pretty powerful point. You think, well, God's up there and he doesn't have feeling about this. There's nothing to do that. No, the Son of God's death was the extent to which our God would go to redeem us back. We who would just as soon at that point have spit in his face as to received anything good from him, loves us with an everlasting love that we do not deserve. You start to begin to scratch that understanding of love and you realize all of a sudden, I need to have a power that I don't have in my understanding. So Paul prays, I pray that you may have power 
to grasp with all of God's people how high, how wide, how long, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses our ability to know about it. You get that in one's life and experience. Bar the door, Katie, because they're just going to take off. They won't have time to dabble in their secret sin because their heart has been strangely warmed by the fact that God loved them so much that they would not think of disgracing this God or embarrassing this God. Turn to Ephesians 5.10. I think this is the shortest verse in the book of Ephesians. I could be wrong, but it's my favorite one. And the way the NIV translates it, I think, is perfect. And find out what pleases the Lord. You all see that there? And find out what pleases the Lord. What do some of your trans... I know I'm not asking... I usually have interaction, so this is an unusual night. Just kind of take it and... We'll get some interaction in a bit. But what kind of translations do you, you have? What, what do they say for 510? Prove what is acceptable to the Lord. That's a good one. Thank you. Others? Trying to learn what is pleasing. Yeah. Try to learn what's pleasing to the Lord. Putting in the effort. Putting in the effort to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Wow. These are great. I, I think I can say I've been in my life, and I've preached in my life several thousand sermons. I've never preached on that text, and I've never heard one sermon on that text. And yet it seems to be the heart of what the Christian life is about, doesn't it? Put in some effort, great translation, figure out what it is that pleases God. Now, why would you do that? Think of the person that perhaps you fell in love with and you wanted to do everything possible to please them. You may still want to do that, I hope. But there was a passion in your heart to prove that you loved them. What, what is it that makes you happy? Linda never wants me to say anything about her in, in these settings. Okay. I'm sorry, Linda. <laughs> Mute your phone and, and we'll be back. But here's what I, I can say with an honest, sincere heart. Linda struggles to find out what pleases the, the people who mean the most to her in her life. I've had the worst week, I think, in about, uh, well, in the 25 years I've been here. This is a humdinger. I have no need to tell you anything about it. I can just tell you this. I was so glad that I said yes this summer to teach this class because the words that we're getting into in a moment have given me life and breath this week. I come home yesterday evening and Linda has for me the most delicious um, stuffed shells. Okay, you put, she's from Connecticut, so they make real, real Italian food up there. You know, none of this cottage cheese stuff. It's the regat and mozzarella and the real stuff. In the, it is perhaps the most heavenly dish this side of heaven. It is incredible. And I come through the door and I realize that that's what she's done after I just say, yeah, this is, this is what I need. So I'm sorry if I've embarrassed you, Linda. It was great. <laughs> And I'm, <clears throat> I'm just amazed that she knows how to do that. I wish I could put one-tenth of the effort into finding out, what do you want me to do, God? What is pleasing to you, Lord? And why would I even be doing that? It's because of the incredible, gracious love that God has shown to us in Jesus Christ. So instead of, oh, you want me not to, you want me to love my enemy, God? Instead of that, it's, you know what, when I was an enemy, when I was an enemy to the cause of God, 
you step forward. You remember that passage in Romans chapter 5? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ moved toward me when I was an enemy. What else should I be doing? Instead of grumbling about it, I say, oh, yes, you remind me of that, Lord. Your love is great. Your mercy is great. How can I ever say enough or do enough in gratitude? So let me walk that way without grumbling or complaining that I can't punch the enemy in the face, but instead I have to just take it. I learned from Christ, who when he was insulted, <laughs> did not insult back, who when he was reviled, did not revile back, but who instead entrusted himself, says Peter, to God, who is the just judge. Yeah? That is amazing. So how high is Christ's love for us? How wide is this love? How deep is this love? How broad is this? Do you see what Paul is doing with words? He's attempting to stretch our dimensions so that the love that we understand God has for us in Jesus Christ cannot be reached by words that we have to describe them in the distant dimensions. They can only be given in pictures in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Our sins are removed from God as far as the east is from the west. God casts our sin in the sea of forgetfulness and remembers them no more. That's God's love. That's the mercy that God has for us. So when we raise the question, do I want to serve God or do I want to walk away from God in this particular whatever movement it is? When I struggle with that, it's because I don't understand God's love enough. I'm suggesting to you something that my grandfather knew so well. An old Pentecostal preacher filled with the Spirit in 1929 led Calvin's own grandfather to the Lord and set him forth to preach. I knew the pages for a long time in that community and area, the area next to us, and Grandpa was a changed individual in 1929. What took on him and the others was the spirit of the living God. In 1902, my grandfather experienced, at the age of seven, a divorce of his parents, something that was extraordinarily rare. He was not taken by the father or by the mother, but was taken and sent to aunts and uncles, and some of them treated him well and some of them didn't. By the age of nine, he was on his own, a farmhand, working a day wage. He never passed the fourth grade because of that. Lying in a, a, a bed of the owner, there was one family that took him in and treated him really well while he was a hand there. And lying in a bed with his eyes swollen shut because of a, uh, a pneumonia-like thing that had gotten into his eyes, a cold that had gotten into his eyes, he heard that some person nearby was going to come and bring some herbs and help him out. So without ever seeing this person, she comes in with poultices and herbs and special remedies. This is about the year 1913 or 14, maybe 1912 even. And she lays that on his face she puts some kind of witch hazel or something around. I have no idea what, what those herb doctors would do. Grandpa never saw her. But he said by her touch, it was the first time in my life I felt love. A few weeks later, he was healed. That came 
came about, he was better, might have been a week later. She came back to see how her patient was doing, the 16 year old, <laughs> and he would have been about 14. So grandpa says it this way, I wish I could have, you know, we didn't have cameras back then. You didn't have a phone back then. You could, so it's all my memory, but I wish you could see how he shared the story. I was sitting on the front porch, he said, and away in the distance, I see this woman, short woman with a round face in the moonlight, and the moon shone on her face in such a way that it was just brilliant, brilliantly bouncing off of that. And as she got closer, I knew she was the one that had done this on my eyes and brought help to me and touched me. And he said, I'm going to marry that woman. <laughs> And he did. That was my grandmother, Essie. And what he, as a person who had never felt a touch of love in his life, understood it through the touch of her hand. 20 years later, he gets saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, sent forth to preach. I'm sharing that because I don't have records of, or uh, tapes of my grandfather's preaching, but I remember as a kid one thing every sermon he preached came back to. You remember him, don't you, Robin? He came back to the love of God. He could preach on the love of God like nobody I've ever heard. And I think, Ray, your, your father was the best preacher I've ever heard. He couldn't hold a candle to, to Grandpa's sermons on love. Why? Because that man understood what it was like not to be loved. So at the age of 85, I go into Grandpa and I say, Grandpa, 50 years in ministry, you just had a stroke. What are you doing? He said, I'm going back. The stroke took part of my memory. I can't remember the scriptures like I used to. I'm going back beginning with Genesis. And he had taken notes. He said, I'm in the book of Daniel now. He had gone that far since the stroke to remind himself of this. And then he looked at me and said, if only I were your age. I was 25. If only I were your age. I belong so much to go up into the Upper Peninsula and start a work at Dollar Bay. I said, Grandpa, there's nothing up there except people who really are crazy because they love snow that's 10 feet high. I'm serious, the UP, are, they're crazy folk, aren't they, Robin? <laughs> they have a university up there that is so under the snow, nobody go. they have tunnels under the ground and you go from one class to another in tunnels and you go to the dorms that way. It's because nobody can get out, they stop shoveling after a while because it goes up too high. What in the world are you thinking of, Grandpa? His comment to me was, once you see the need of people who are lost, you cannot get that burning out of your heart. <laughs> Boy, wouldn't that be something to have back in our hearts today? a burning of the Holy Spirit that causes us to love people to such an extent, we will go where there are 10 feet of snow. Before that time, I had told God where I would not go. <laughs> it was enough, I thought, that I said yes to the call of God. He, was, he should be grateful just to get me there. <laughs> but after that, I said, I will go to Africa and eat monkey meat. I will live in places where there are snakes longer than anything I've ever seen before. I will go where... I came to Cleveland, didn't I? <laughs> I will go where there's a bastion of the enemy. I just want that heart that at 85, it was still gleaming in his eye. He wanted more of God and the Word, and he wanted to sell people about that. If you understand the love of God that is in Christ, there's a different motivation for why you do what you do.
learn Christ. Flip to the next page. Here's where it gets dicey. And here's where I've been crying so much in this part because the Holy Spirit has convicted me in the next part. Okay, let's read chapter 4, verses 22 and following. And for the sake of people being able to hear it, I'm going to read it myself uh, for you. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, okay, I'm gonna to get to the therefore in a moment because we're gonna read it in a version that I've written for you in the next page. Before we get to the therefore, I want you to see what step two is. After you learn Christ, put off your old self. Huh? This is the word for laying down a garment. In fact, the word old there actually means a worn out something. Lay down your old worn out self, just like you would a moth eaten garment that can't do its job anymore. And put on, be renewed in the attitude of your mind and put on the new pristine self that's created to be like God and in his image of the creator. What does this look like? That's where I think verses 25 and following help us to see. What does it mean to put off and to put on? Okay, so take the third page and it should have at the top something like Ephesians 4, verses 25 and following. Okay, so this, for those on, online, this is what I can be sending you. Just write me and ask for it. Uh, this is what I'm calling an expanded translation. You know, when you talk in one language and someone is translating, they have to conceptualize what you're trying to say and kind of put it in there. All translations try to do that. So not any one translation is perfect. But sometimes there are nuances in the language that get missed. So what I've tried to do without being too heady about it is to rewrite this passage from, that rewrite's not a, retranslate this passage from 425 through 55. Why I've given you a colorized sheet is because many times when commands are given in scripture, especially in the New Testament, the Greek language has specific ways of saying those commands that are not like English. So watch what that does, all those colored things. I've put the same, st same style of command in the same color or anything that I've highlighted. Watch what that does to this passage of how we're to put off and put on. Ready, verse 25. Because of this, having put off once for all the lie, each of you keep on speaking the truth with their neighbor. You see the phrase, keep on speaking? That's a command form in Greek that requires you to translate it that way. But most versions don't. Okay. For we are members, all members belonging to one another. Keep on being angry, but the word anger here has probably the meaning of a righteous passion. You know the phrase in the King James, be angry and sin not, that's this phrase. Keep on being angry with a righteous passion, and but then comes the next word. But stop sinning. Uh, it, it's often difficult to put those two phrases together, isn't it? But I think this makes sense. You can have a righteous passion for something and be upset about why it's being handled a certain way, but you let that go on too long, 
and that's where I'm getting the very next phrase, the sun going down. You let that go on too long, and guess what? Sin will come into what was once of righteous anger. So stop sinning. Stop allowing the sun to go down on your exasperated, embittered wrath. There are three different words Paul uses in this context for the word anger. Isn't that amazing? The Greek language is much more specific than our language. Well, anger is, in this sense, one that causes embitteredness. Have you met such people before? Who cannot, you just scratch the surface of them and the, all you hear is the bitterness that has come about in their life. Everything has gone wrong. And stop giving the devil an occasion for acting. Now, notice those stop words. Paul's implying they were already allowing it. They were already doing it. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? I know you're doing this. Stop doing it. Stop sinning. Stop allowing the sun to go down in your wrath. And stop, for goodness sake, stop giving the devil an occasion for, for acting. Don't open the door for the devil. Let those who steal stop stealing. Rather, let such persons keep on working, making with their own hands something good in order to constantly have something to continually be sharing with those in need. Stop allowing rotten, putrid, garbage-like words. It couldn't be any clearer, I hope, than that. Because that's precisely the word in Greek that it is. And I, it took me three words to try to get that across. Putrid, rotten, garbage-like words. Don't stop allowing them to proceed from your mouths. But only what is good for building others up with respect to their need, so that it may indeed, here's that line, this is an incredible line, it may give grace to those who hear and stop grieving the Holy Spirit. By whom you were sealed to the day of redemption, make a commitment. Here's another command that is a different tense. Make a commitment to put away from you all kinds of harshness, violent outbreaks of wrath, anger, brawling that spills over into yelling, and evil speaking that is meant to injure others. Keep on being gracious to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other in a gracious manner, just as God in Christ has forgiven you in a gracious manner. Two major words for forgiveness in the New Testament. One word means to release. Let it go, let it go. You know, that wonderful movie song, just release the thing. Can, can you see how that word is a good forgiveness word? But the second word is the one Paul uses here. Give grace. It literally only means give grace. Well, then how do we know it's about forgiving? Because you're treating people the way Jesus Christ treats you. Was God gracious to you in Jesus? Here we're back again. If you don't understand the love of God in Christ, how are you going to understand why you're treating people so graciously. It isn't because they ask forgiveness. It isn't because they deserve your graciousness. It's you're gracious because God has been gracious to you. You have a whole new reason for living the way you do. And it doesn't have anything to do with your concern as to whether, well, they just didn't do that right. Yeah, they maybe they didn't. But you keep on being gracious. You give grace. You cover over a multitude of sins with love. You bask them in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that you received. Therefore, chapter 5, keep on being imitators, becoming imitators of God, just like well-loved children. And keep on walking in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up on our behalf and in our stead as an offering, a sacrifice to God that smells sweet. Can you hear the repetition of, just as Jesus did this to you, you do this to others? Over and over and over again, there's a principle 
that follows how God gives to us grace in Jesus Christ is how we then live toward others. Stop allowing sexual immorality or any kind of impurity to be even named among you because these actions are improper among God's holy people. Stop allowing shameless obscenity, the talk of fools or witty speech that seems polished but is really coarse. These actions are out of place among holy people. Instead, there must be the giving of thanks. For you know this so well, it is like a custom to you. No sexually immoral or impure person, no covetous person who is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God, of Christ and God. Okay, th three arenas, and we're right at the end of uh, tonight's lesson. So let me tell you what I would like you to do for next time and what we'll be doing, but let me end it with this little spot. There are three arenas of life that you're to put off the old and put on the new. So if you're writing down, these are the three things under step two and step three. I find this to be just so fascinating. They're the same things. They can group these into three areas. Number one, communication. Put off the old way of talking. And put on a new way of talking. Right? So communication is the first area. The second, emotions. Don't let the sun go down on, the, on your wrath. Get rid of all bitterness and rage. You see, okay, we're going to look at those much more closely next week. And then the third one is actions. Put off bad communication, bad emotions, and bad acting. And then Paul just lists what's, what, are, what is in each of those. I'll show that to you more clearly next week. I just want you to get the broader point. But then, when you, how do you put on Christ? Remember I told you I think the whole t Christian church fails us by not teaching us how to do something. This is what I think Paul is telling us to do. How do you put on Christ? How do you put off this stuff? You put on holy communication. He says, speak truthfully to each other. You put on emotions that are good. So instead of bad emotions and bad communication, good communication, good emotions, speak only what is upbuilding to the others and be kind and compassionate and tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And your actions of forgiving as Christ forgave you, do something, don't steal anymore, do something with your hands. So here's this incredible small section of scripture that summarizes the three major areas of our lives, whether you're in sin, or whether you're a Christian who's still sinning, or whether you are wanting to be a saint and holy. And it is, what are you communicating? Do not let anything unwholesome come out of your mouth. You just don't need to talk dirt about others, or, you know, this can be everything from gossip, although Paul doesn't mention gossip here, this is enough here, just talking in ways that do not build up the other. I'm going to squeeze the lemon juice out of that one next week, okay? A second, besides communication, emotions. And that's where I'm putting the anger that's out of control. Rage, brawling, just spills over into violent action. And the third, then, uh, is the action of every form of malice and Stealing, do not steal. Instead, you just forgive as Christ forgave you. Okay, your assignment. These are a lot of words, but I know they're anointed word by the words, I mean, in what's here in the passage of Ephesians 4. But I know the words are anointed of God and his spirit. I would pray that you would read this as I've written it here every night before you go to bed, or every morning when you wake up, one or the other, once a day. I don't think that's too much to ask. And, you know, if you forget it a day, don't start flagellating yourself on the back, you know, just, just get up and go on. But I think there's something so powerful here that the Word of God itself will get into your heart and change you. There, there's something also, by change you, I mean, 
highlight things in your life that need to be changed. <laughs> yeah, you just can't get away from that word of God is as sharp as a two-edged sword. So part of why I'm crying tonight is because the Lord's been sawing away with his word. It's just not been a comfortable week for me, which is okay, because I've given him permission to do what he needs to do to make me holy. You see, that's what I want, because I know that's what pleases him. <laughs> it's just not always that comfortable. <laughs> ah, then the next page is an expanded translation of chapter 3 of Colossians, because Paul does almost the exact same thing in Colossians that he does in Ephesians. And I want us to compare that next week, so your assignment is also to read the Colossians passage that I have here. Both of these are about a chapter long or less. So try to do that, maybe one in the morning, one at night. See what's the same, see what's different. See if what I've been suggesting and talking to you about tonight kind of rings true with you. Next week, I'm gonna expect you to be talking. I don't believe teaching is a one-way street, okay? But maybe the Lord had to do something here tonight, uh, maybe to adjust me. I'm not sure uh, what God was doing here tonight. I'm gonna have a conversation with him about that later tonight <laughs> because I am not comfortable when the Spirit of God does this to me. Never have been. This is just not, okay, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Either I'm a servant or I'm not, so just shut up, Terry, and go on. All right, so let me pray for you as we leave here right now, okay? Lord, I cannot begin to grasp how much you love us. Give us the power necessary to know how high, how wide, how deep, how long and broad is the love of God in Christ Jesus. Give us a heart to find out what pleases the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, who loved us with such a love. Amen.